You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Yes, yes, Pete. Here's a nut for you. Now, don't bother me, if you please. I have work to do. I'd like to speak to Mr. O'Connor, please. <clears throat> That's right. Um, I'd rather not say. It's rather <clears throat> personal. That's it, Pete. Stay on your perch like a good bird. It's a boy. <clears throat> Is this Mr. O'Connor? Mr. O'Connor, uh, I'll get right to the point. You have a young gentleman working for you in personnel. His name is... Uh, Brewster. Alfred Brewster? Been with your firm about a year and a half? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what about it. The man is a communist. That's correct, a communist, with certain terrorist affiliations as well. Never mind who this is. Let's just say a concerned citizen, all right? What is of the essence is the character of one of your employees. I happen to know that this man, Brewster, is a subversive and a menace to our society. What am I suggesting? Why, I think it's obvious. I'm suggesting he should be discharged immediately, given his walking papers and shown the door. Never mind how I know. I know, that's all. That's all. Now I'm going to check back in a few days, and if he hasn't been discharged, I'll be forced to take this matter to a higher authority. That's right, to the corporate office. Correct? Goodbye, Mr. O'Connor. <sighs> Rather a full day, Pete, wouldn't you say? Eleven so far. Eleven names on this list. A bit of sharpen my pencil. And scratch off one more. Of course, it's questionable what concrete results we can expect. But at least the seeds have been planted. Oh, yes. The opening guns fired. The first salvo, so to speak. Hello, Board of Education? Well, please connect me. Yes, I'd like to speak with the superintendent of schools, please. It's a personal call. No, I'm not at liberty to give my name. That's right. It's urgent. Is this the superintendent? Yeah, this is a concerned citizen. I'm calling about a teacher and your employee. That's correct. His name is... His name is Farwell. William J. Farwell. He teaches at your North End High School. That is correct. The man is morally objectionable. He's a drinker, a carouser, and I have it on good authority that his relationships with students are questionable at best. The man should be investigated immediately. Oh, yes. Never mind who this is. I happen to be giving you facts, and that is what is at issue here. Well, you best check on him. You most certainly should, and without delay. Quite right. Here you are, Pete. There you go. That's a good bird. You know, I'm rather tired. It's been quite a full day. You don't realize just how tired you can get during a campaign. But a dedicated man isn't concerned with physical discomfort or fatigue or anything else for that matter. No, a truly dedicated person is interested only, only in victory in the conquest of morality over the forces of immorality.
Hey, look at them out there. The dregs. Carrion. Leeches sucking us dry. Oh, yes. Carrying evil around with them like infectious germs. We're gonna have to face it sooner or later. Huh? Phone calls are one thing. Threats and exposure are simply expedients. No, Peter, my friend. We're gonna have to embark on a much more ambitious course. Some major surgery, I think. The long scalpel, honed sharp and cutting deep. If the sickness is extensive, so must be the cure. And it must be today, Peter. It must be today, this afternoon. Uh, four o'clock. Oh, yes, that's when it will occur. Yes, we'll make it occur at four o'clock. At that moment, at that moment, we will destroy evil. That is both my charge and my obligation, Peter, to destroy evil. And we shall do it at precisely four o'clock. I'm not sure of the method yet, but it'll come to me. Oh, yes. It'll come to me. Most assuredly, it will come to me. And it'll be a revelation, an epiphany. It will be... It will be the expiration of immorality everywhere. The exordium of the end. Four o'clock, Peter. That's when we'll have it happen. Whatever it is. Four o'clock this very day. This is Mr. Oliver Krangle, a dealer in petulance and poison a self-appointed, self-designated, self-ordained vigilante whose jaundiced eyes peer out at an unholy world and find it undeserving of anything but judgment and punishment. And Mr. Oliver Krangle is both the judge and the executioner. He has rather arbitrarily chosen 4 p.m. as his personal gotodamorum. We are about to watch the metamorphosis of a twisted little fanatic poisoned by the gangrene of prejudice to the status of an avenging angel Upright and omniscient, dedicated and fearsome. Whatever your clock say, it's almost four o'clock. And wherever you may think you are, at this moment you happen to be in the twilight zone. And now, the twilight zone and our story, Four O'Clock. Starring Stan Freeberg with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yes? Mr. Kringle? What is it? Well, there's a special delivery for you. Uh, just a minute. <sighs> Here you go. A whole lot of stuff. Eight or ten envelopes, at least. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Uh, something else, was there? Something... No, nothing else. Then in that case, why do you stand there trying to read the contents of these envelopes as if you were an x-ray machine, hmm? Me? Read your mail? Oh, I can assure you, Mr. Krangle, I have many more things to do than trying to read my tenant's mail. Your mail in particular. Huh, I feel reassured. You sure get enough of it. Somebody think you were running some sort of mail order business or something. Just look at that desk of yours. So much mail and papers and I don't know what all. What is your business, Mr. Kringle? What I do is none of your concern. I pay my rent on time, huh? And I keep to myself. A respect for privacy you should learn, Mrs. Williams. Well, I never... Uh, you never? Uh, that's good to know. Now, have you any more comments to air? Because if not, I would greatly appreciate your leaving me alone. I have a great deal of work to do. I believe that. The question is, what kind of work? You should believe it. You may thank me one day, Mrs. Williams. Oh, yeah. You and everyone else. Assuming you're still around, and assuming you retain the capacity to feel appreciation. What's that supposed to mean? 
Assuming I'll be around. Are you threatening me or something, Mr. Crangle? Threatening you, Mrs. Williams? I don't threaten people, my dear lady. I compile files on them. I compile them, and I analyze them, and I investigate them. And then I categorize them, and I judge them. Oh, yes. If they're impure, they must be punished. If, on the other hand, they are simply misled or naive or unsophisticated, I point them to the right way. I lead them by the hand, Mrs. Williams. I show them the proper course, the path to redemption. Is that... <laughs> what I mean is, is that what you do for a living? Indeed. In short, I check evil, Mrs. Williams, and I eradicate it. Inoculate it, wipe it clean, and sponge it away. And you know where these... these evil people are? I most certainly do, Mrs. Williams. Can you give me an example? How about this one? <clears throat> Mrs. Claire Williams, age 54, widow, formerly married to John Alistair Williams. Political affiliation, none. Husband's political affiliation, none. Evidence of subversion, none. Negative personality traits, curiosity, and ignorance. Of course, that's just a preliminary report, Mrs. Williams. The in-depth research is in the master file cabinet right over there. Oh, well... <laughs> Aren't you the strange one? You ain't nothing if you're not a strange one. I'll be going now, Mr. Crangle. Had your nap, Pete? All rested up, are we? Eh, well, that's a good young parrot. It's going to be an exciting afternoon, Pete. Big things are going to happen at four o'clock. Eh, yes, they are indeed. Four o'clock? What's going to happen at four o'clock? Interesting question, Mrs. Williams. A very interesting question. Very much to the point. What's going to happen indeed? At four o'clock, we're going to expose evil. Strip it bare. Push it out into the light. Dissect it. Pinpoint it. And eliminate it. You are? Exercise it. Denude it. Confute it. Destroy it! Oh, now, careful, Mr. Crangle. You've gone and broken your lamp. What? Oh, oh, the lamp. Uh, I see. Uh, sorry. Well, no matter. Would you like me to clean that up for you? No, I'm quite capable of cleaning up after myself, madam. That's one thing I'm very good at. Cleaning. Uh, something else was there, Mrs. Williams? No. No, I, I, I don't believe so. If it's all the same to you, I'll just... I'll be on my way. Saints preserve us. Excuse me! Oh! Yes, I'm looking for a Mr. Krangle. I can't imagine why. I was told he lives in this building. Oh, he lives here, all right. There ain't no doubt about that with a vengeance. He lives here right there at the top of the next landing. But if you ask me, young woman, you won't be going in there without police protection. Is that right? If you ask me, the man has a leak in his attic a mile wide. I ain't sure anymore that... that he's safe to have around. Mr. Krangle? <clears throat> Mr. Krangle? Well... My name's... Who else is with you? Why, no one. Are you sure? Yes, quite sure. My name is Lucas. I wonder if I could speak with you for a moment. Lucas, Lucas, ah yes, Lucas. Kurt J., age 27, intern, Eastside Hospital. That's my husband. Is he indeed? Well now, well now, your husband, you say. Uh, come in, please, please, come, come, come. Have a seat, by all means. Thank you. Now, uh, what about your husband? Why, Mr. Krangle? Why what? Why are you trying to hurt him? Hurt? 
My dear lady. What has he ever done to you? To me? Why, nothing to me. That is, nothing personally. I don't know your husband, Mrs. Lucas. That is to say, I know of him. Oh, yes, I know of his background, but we've never met. He's a stranger to you, then, isn't he? He's a perfect stranger. A stranger, yes, but not a perfect stranger, Mrs. Lucas. Uh, by no means. Your husband happens to be most imperfect. And when you perceive, quite correctly, that he's done nothing to me, at least not directly, I hasten to enlighten you. He nonetheless happens to have done a great deal against society. In what way? Ho, ho, don't play dumb with me. Don't give me any of that naive stuff. My husband, for your information, Mr. Krangle, is a dedicated young doctor. A gentle, decent, fine human being. He has only one abiding interest in life, and that is to cure, to heal, to stop pain. And to kill. How can you say such a thing? Yeah, that's his other abiding interest, the one you've conveniently skipped. L, 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 U, C, Lucas. Uh, here we go. I know his file well. <clears throat> Lucas, Kurt J, MD. Second year intern, Eastside Hospital. This year, on the night of March 12th, while serving in the emergency ward, he permitted the death of one Mrs. Angela Rienti by failing to relieve pressure accumulated as a result of a brain injury sustained in a traffic accident. It wasn't his fault. It was too late. That's his only crime. He wasn't able to treat her because he was responsible for half the ward that night. And by the time he got to the woman, she was already dead. That's your interpretation. It's not an interpretation. It's a fact. It's exactly the way it happened. By the time he got to her, by the time she was put into his care, she'd already died. He should have gotten to her earlier. How could he? Do you know how many lives he saved that night? How many people he saves every day, every week? He did nothing to her. That's about the size of it, Mrs. Lucas. Miserable dereliction of duty resulting in the untimely death of a woman who by rights should be alive today. These facts came to my attention, and I simply called them to the attention of the hospital supervisor, an institution, by the way, which I helped to support through taxes. By what right? I must ask you, Mr. Krangle. Excuse me, but by what right do you presume to pass judgment on my husband? You're not even a medical man. Why, why, you weren't even there that night. You don't know anything about it. And yet you write your letters to the hospital, dozens of nasty letters accusing my husband of being a, a murderer. Why, you, you wretched, small-minded. Enough, Mrs. Lucas. That will be quite enough. I've suffered your presence here. But I'm not required to tolerate your abusiveness, although I don't wonder you're the type of woman you are. Oh, and what type is that? You're obviously greatly attracted to your husband, and there's no secret that birds of a feather... Well, you know the rest. I think I catch your implication, Mr. Krangle, and you're over the line, way over the line. You're as cracked as that... that lamp of yours. Hmm, tell me, has the hospital discharged your husband yet? Discharged? That's right. Let him go. Cashiered him out. Eradicated him from the payroll. Given him the sack. I've been expecting it momentarily. They have not, Mr. Krangle. They have done no such thing. It'd take more than a letter-writing campaign from a... A crank like you to make that happen. Your husband is an evil man. He is no such thing. And I will not put up with evil in any form. And I will not stand by and allow an injustice like this. Of all the presumptuous, wrong-headed... I... I'm sorry, Mrs. Lucas. <clears throat> I haven't any more time. Why, look at the hour. It's three o'clock already. I got things to do. Many more important things to do, thank you. Today's mail, for instance. You'd probably be interested in these. They're cases not unlike your husband's. 
communists, subversives, thieves, harlots, but all made out of the same metal. Evil, Mrs. Lucas, all of them evil, and I will not countenance evil. I am absolutely incapable of countenancing it. You're probably unaware of it, Mr. Krangle, but my husband is a very sensitive man. Oh, please, spare me. Your letters have had an effect on him, if on no one else so far. The people at the hospital tell him to ignore the letters, forget about them, but they're tearing him up inside. They're killing him. His confidence in himself, his ability to concentrate and work. You see, he's like a lot of doctors, Mr. Krangle. He cares. He cares very deeply. So, you see, you really have been quite successful after all. I imagine you've been equally successful with other people, too. Mm -hmm. There's too much sanity still left out there for you to have succeeded in having them all fired. Mm -hmm. But you must be hurting them, those men and women, mm -hmm. hurting them desperately, as you've hurt my husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've really accomplished a great deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Tell me, Mr. Krangle. If you can, that is. Why? What's that? Why do you do it? I really need to understand. Why? You ask me why? Why? Because they're evil. That's it precisely. Nothing too complicated about that, is there? They're evil. Plain and simple. Here, take a look out the window. All those little bugs down there, you see? Bacteria. That's what they are. That's what your husband is. All those little... <laughs> That's it. That's precisely it. What is? That's what I'll do. I've finally gotten the clue. I said little, little, you understand? <laughs> That's what I'll do. I'll turn all the evil people into, into little ones, understand? I'll make all the evil people, uh, let's see, three, three feet. No, two feet, two feet tall. That's it. At four o'clock this afternoon, at precisely four o'clock, every evil man and woman will become a mere two feet tall! <laughs> a revelation! An absolute revelation! Peter, my lad, did you hear what I came up with? Did you? Hmm? That's it! Do you see the beauty of it, Pete? That's it! It's brilliant! Absolutely brilliant! Two feet tall, Pete! Two feet tall! <laughs> At four o'clock this afternoon, I'm gonna turn all the evil people, the wicked, morally stunted troublemakers everywhere, into tiny little freaks for all the world to see. I'll make them all two feet tall. Two feet tall, I say. Yes, it'll be better than if they wore badges on their clothing. Impossible for them to hide. The purest form of poetic justice. Evil will be made an object of universal scorn, laughter, humiliation. Yes, yes, you're not. You're hungry, aren't you, Pete? Here, here you go, boy. I won myself. <laughs> we must be strong, the two of us. Strong for what's about to happen. <laughs> That's right, Petey. Ten minutes past three. It won't be long now. Yes, yes, a peanut. Here you are. That's a good strong boy. <laughs> I'll bet you could crack open just about anything with that great big beak of yours, couldn't you? Yes, you could. I'm sure you could. <laughs> Look at them down there, all those wicked little people. They don't know just how little yet. No, of course not. But they will. 
They will. It's their day of judgment. Oh, yes. Time to finish our preparations, Pete. There's much to do. Eh, less than 50 minutes left now. Must be sure all our pencils are sharp. We have a great many names to cross off the list. Cross off the list. Soon now. Very soon. Yes, yes. Oliver Kringle? Come in, come in. Uh, yes, I'm Oliver Kringle. Uh, I'm the one who called. Yes, sir. Agent Luther Hall, Mr. Kringle, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Our office received a call. Indeed, indeed, yes. Uh, I placed the call and asked you to come. Uh, I felt it was my civic duty. Uh, uh, can I get you a cup of coffee or something? No, thank you. Now, Mr. Kringle, you told the office that you had some sort of list, proof of criminal activity, and that today would be a day of reckoning. Uh, what exactly did you mean by... Sit down, please, yes. Uh, there's plenty of time. We have more than 45 minutes before it happens. Before what happens, Mr. Kringle? <laughs> That's the point. That's the whole point. That's why I called you here. And why is that? <clears throat> I felt the FBI should know. I also called the police and the fire department. I even got a call into Washington. Oh, yes. Although the latter message probably won't go all the way to the top. <laughs> it's my understanding that the Reds are in complete control in Washington now. I imagine they've taken over the switchboards, too. The Reds, Mr. Kringle. Oh, yes, indeed. The Reds. It's a complete conspiracy, you know, Mr. Hall. All the evil people are banding together now. All the subversives, the commies, the terrorists, the thieves of the American dream. It's a total, absolute, worldwide conspiracy. You said on the phone that you had a plan of some sort. Oh, my, yes. It all takes place at four o'clock. I thought you people ought to know because, well, you'll have your hands full. Our hands? Picking up all the guilty parties. Oh, yes. You see, Agent Hall, I've spent a good many years doing this kind of work. Just look at all those file cabinets there. Years of dedication to the cause. I've made a study of evil. Oh, yes, indeed. A complete study of it. I cut out newspaper clippings. I listen to the radio and watch television. I follow every major court case that's going on. I compile a completely airtight list of charges against all of them, the evil people. What do you do with them, Mr. Kringle? Do with them? I follow through, of course. I follow them through to their conclusion. I write letters to employers. I, I make phone calls late at night. Oh, they hate that. Oh, yes. It's one of the most effective methods, as you probably know. Calling those terrible people late at night. The later, the better. Getting them up constantly, waking them, enumerating my charges, speaking out, and then hanging up. Uh -huh. They hate it. Very frustrating for them. I'll bet. Oh, yes, indeed. They go out of their minds with fury. <laughs> they don't like to be awakened late at night, I can assure you. Who does? Yeah, but with these people, it's absolutely necessary. The evil people, you understand. The destabilizers. The the enemies of order. But t to get to the point, Mr. Hall, the point... And what is the point? The clock on the shelf there tells the story. The entire and complete story. It's twenty past three now. In exactly four... Forty minutes, all the evil people in the world will be reduced to half. No, no, a third of their present size. Oh, it'll be glorious. <laughs> all the unpunished murderers and the tyrants, the proud and the sinful, the schoolyard bullies, the cruel teachers and faithless friends, the wrongdoers, blackmailers, and the nicotine fiends too, and the thieves, and the harlots, and the transgressors, all of them! Every one! How does that sound, Mr. Hall? How do you propose to go about doing this? I mean, shrinking people. I merely will it, that's all. 
I will it. I've been giving it a great deal of thought. Now, in the past, various other plans、uh, have crossed my mind. Other plans? Well, for example, I didn't approve of our entering any of the wars. You see, and I had it in mind I might take the stiffness out of airplane propellers. Do you understand? I'm not sure I do. Well, when the crews came out in the morning. Bundled up like children against the cold, and then went into their planes. They'd find the props hanging limp like great empty banana skins. <laughs> then the war ended, and、uh, well, it seemed like a waste of effort at that point. After that, jets became the order of the day, and so I thought, what would jam up the intakes on those jet engines? Huh? What? Better than a flock of birds. <laughs> oh, not you, Petey. Not the beautiful, brave, loyal parrots of the world. Oh no, just your low-class country cousins. You read about it from time to time. Seagulls that get sucked into jets cause them to fail. So naturally, I thought, chickens. Chickens. Ignorant. Heh. <laughs> Can't speak. An army of them, bred to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, release them on runways just at the moment of takeoff. That would ground those bombers and cargo planes, but fast. Of course, there'd still be trucks and overland supply routes. And then I read in the paper a year or so ago about an accident, a bad traffic accident. Three people were killed. So I decided I would change all the wheels in the world from round to square, or maybe even triangular, so they'd stub in the asphalt and stop in their tracks. <laughs> you mean sabotage interstate commerce? I devised another method later on. Terribly interesting, I thought. <clears throat> Mark all the evil people on the forehead, or better yet, turn them all one color. Say、mm, purple, but then it came to me that <clears throat> they'd simply be able to recognize each other more readily and band together in their collective wickedness. I see. Well, Mr. Hall, this is hard to believe, but I hit upon this latest idea about the change in size just this afternoon. Yeah, some benighted woman was in here, and she quite inadvertently gave me the clue I needed. Make them all two feet tall. Now, what could be simpler? Think of it, Mr. Hall. Think how ineffectual this will render them. They can't handle delicate scientific instruments, or typewriters, or computers, or telephones because they can't reach them. They won't even be able to open a window or turn a doorknob to escape once we know where they are. Why? Pretty soon they'll be as extinct as. Dinosaurs. Here's a peanut for you, Petey. <clears throat> I think, Mr. Hall, that the most interesting place will be, let's say, a murder trial, where nobody knows whether the accused is guilty or not. And then at four o'clock, if he's guilty, <laughs> or watching the drunkards in a saloon, or oh, there's so many places, so many places to be. Mr. Kringle. Yes. I'd like to ask you a question, sir, and I hope you don't take offense at it. Go on, go on. Have you ever had any psychiatric help, sir? What? Psychiatric help. I don't think you're rational. I think you've developed some kind of obsession here, and I think you need some help. Help? Me? I need help. Why should I need help? I'm not evil. You obviously don't understand any of this, do you? I'm not the evil one. It's them. It's them. It's all of them out there on the street. Just take a look out the window. See, they're the evil ones. They're the ones who are going to be two feet tall in just thirty minutes. That's when it's going to happen. In just thirty minutes. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Kringle, but、uh, there doesn't seem to be very much we can do about all this. What do you mean? Why, the law enforcement agencies are going to have round-the-clock schedules from now on. Do you realize how many evil people you're going to be able to find? Why, they'll be all over the sidewalks, all over the streets. You'll have to build more jails. You have to build more electric chairs, gas chambers, gallows, penitentiaries. 
Well, well, what about it? What are you going to do? Nothing, Mr. Kringle. Not a thing. And if you'll forgive a suggestion, that's what I think you should do, too. Nothing. These letters you write, these phone calls, there happens to be something in this country that precludes all that, makes it unnecessary. And what's that? Law, Mr. Kringle. There happens to be law. We like support from citizens. Support, help, cooperation. But interference is quite another thing. Oh, I get it now. I understand. At last I understand. You're part of the conspiracy. That's it. You're one of them. Why, of course. I'm an idiot not to have realized it. Of course you people have gotten into the FBI. It stands to reason you would. You've infiltrated every other place. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Hall. Good day, sir. You'd better enjoy yourself for the next 20 or 30 minutes. You hear me? You'd better enjoy yourself to the utmost because you're going to be 24 inches tall. You and everybody like you. All the evil people, everyone, you'll see. <clears throat> Good riddance to bad rubbish, eh, Pete? To all their kind, the righteous will rise up, and the weak will fall before their terrible wrath. It's as right as rain. <clears throat> In a minute, Pete. It won't be long now. <laughs> Yes, yes, here's your nut. It won't be long now at all. Uh, we must have everything in order, all our pencils sharpened. Weapons that are truly mightier than the sword. And our desk. We must have lots and lots of clean paper to make another list uh, of the newly exposed. Their corruption on display for all the world to see. I wonder what they'll look like down there on the streets. On all the streets everywhere. <laughs> oh, what a glorious sight it's going to be. So many people. Think of it. Fat ones, thin ones, the young and the old, suddenly grown too small for their clothing, which of course will no longer fit them. It simply won't fit them at all. <laughs> Like the toads and the cretins they are. Someone should follow along behind and collect it in trucks. Huh? Boil it in hot water, decontaminate it, and then redistribute it to the rest of us. Think of that, Pete. New suits, trousers, neckties, formal wear, tuxedos, this, and casual wear of every style. Oh, yes. It shouldn't go to waste. Think of how much money could be made in resale centers across the land. Money to finance a whole new campaign. Why, Pete, we could open a chain of clothing stores. Aha! All we need is a fleet of trucks to gather it up. Ours for the taking. But alas, it's too late to organize any of that now. Oh, if only I'd planned ahead. Well... The least I can do is alert the media. Yes, that's a responsible thing to do. I wonder if they have any idea, any idea at all about what's to take place. And at this hour, the Dow Jones is down 14. Raging fire now under control in upstate. <laughs> the White House press secretary announced a peace plan today. Four car pileup on the bridge. Motorists are advised to use alternate routes. <laughs> Come on down to Crazy Joey's Fashion Warehouse. We've got sportswear, clothes for the workplace, back to school duds, all at out of this world prices. You'll think you've died and gone to heaven because my name's Joey and I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Another lost opportunity, Pete. But that man doesn't know how soon he'll be out of business. He has no idea, does he? No idea at all. <laughs> we better check the television news while we're at it. 
We'll have the weather for you coming right up after this. The very Vegger slices, it dices, it turns out finger licking Julian potatoes. Okay, now tell us about your new book, 101 Ways to Profit from Armageddon. Amateurs. Ah, uh, Pete, what to do? What to do? Of course I can send out press releases, taking credit for all that I've done after the fact. If only I had more time. More time! Still, we'll have to alert them as best we can. Yes, put me through to the news department, please. Never mind who this is. Wait, <clears throat> this is, this is Oliver Krangle speaking, C-R-A-N-G-L-E. Yes, that's right. I'm calling with an important bulletin. Yes, for the afternoon broadcast. That's right. You ought to break in right now with a news flash, you know. Oh, it's something big, all right. Something huge. <laughs> Believe me, it is important. When? No, you don't understand. It hasn't happened yet, but your viewers will still want to know when it does happen. Otherwise, there'll be chaos in the city. In fact, this should go on the national broadcast, coast to coast. What is it? Let's just say a new perspective on the world. <laughs> Hello? 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 Ah, uh, Petey. Obviously, they've infiltrated the local news channel as well. Of course they have. I should have known. They're everywhere, like insects, like vermin. Well, they won't be in control much longer, because Judgment Day is upon us. The strong will rise up to take what is theirs, while the subhumans are exterminated. It's the law of nature. But for now, there's precious little left to do, except make sure the clock is wound, and to prepare ourselves for the occasion. Eh, just try to be patient, Pete. Just a few minutes longer. Wait with me, and you'll see that it's all been worth it. I promise. <laughs> but first, I must look my absolute best. Yes, top-notch, befitting a man of my stature. The reporters will swarm up the stairs here, wanting interviews. And there'll be photographers, of course, with their news cameras. Yeah, let's see here. What do you think, Petey? Perhaps a clean shirt and tie? My, my best shoes. I have to pass muster here. Meanwhile, you preen your feathers, my boy, and get ready to meet the press. There! It's happened, Pete! It's happening right now! This very second! Can you feel it? Something in the air! The next phase of evolution for the human race! Oh, nothing will be the same after this. Nothing! The new order has come! At last! <laughs> yes, yes, but first, I can't wait to see them all down there, turning into tiny little gnomes. Just one second, Pete, as soon as I take a look out the window. <coughs> Certainly, Peter. You may have a nut, as many as you like. You must be hungry. I'll have something, too. We'll make it a celebration. This is our day. <coughs> of course, of course, but you must be patient. I can't wait to look outside. I can't wait to... I can't wait... But for some reason... Uh, I can't see over the windowsill. How can that be? I can't even reach the bowl of peanuts. I know you're hungry, but somehow it's just out of my reach. What? Unless someone has moved it, put it in a very high place. But that would have to be someone very tall. Someone very, very tall. Pete, what's happened? You've grown so large, and I, I'm so close to the floor. 
These shoes don't fit me anymore. And these clothes, huh? Whose are they? Must get out of this ridiculous costume. <sighs> Pete, why are you looking at me like that? Your eyes and your beak. Close it. Please close it. You're not still hungry. You can't be. Eh? Pete, <laughs> you're frightening me. You know me, Petey boy. You must. That's a good bird. Yes, yes. Calm down now. No, Pete, no. Get away. Let me get out of here. I can't reach the door now. The locks. Let me. Four o'clock, an evil man made his bed and lay in it. A pot called a kettle black, and a stone thrower broke the windows of its glass house. Not a pretty picture, perhaps, but for this poor, misguided fellow, quite unavoidable. A simple matter of supply and demand. He was right about one thing, though. In a world where the strong get stronger and the mighty feed upon the weak, you can run, but you can't hide. Look for this one under F for fanatic and J for justice in the Twilight Zone.